So people can see my screen now, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, now, as I said, T on was it Wednesday, Metri? Um, it's not really Moodle. You go to to access any of the resources for this module. You go to this uh, website here, and so if you go click on that link, if you click on that link, you'll be brought to here. Uh, and this site is going to build over time. There's one or two things getting in my way now, so I just need to just give me one second. Okay, um, this is going to build over time. Today, I want to delve into this card here. In other words, I want to start talking about JavaScript. So if I click on that card, and this will be the standard kind of format that you would see now uh, as we work our way through this. So these two cards here, uh, behind them are the lecture, the lecture slides that I want to work through. I'll only probably work through these today. These two cards here, behind those are two lab exercises uh, that I want you to work through over the next uh, approximate week, I guess. Hopefully after today's lecture, you will be able to work through this lab. And if I go into the lab, then they're all, they're just sections that you work your way through step-by-step. Step. Uh, most of the labs are fairly prescriptive. Uh, every now and again, there's exercises or challenges. Um, so that's for the lab anyway. So let's go back to uh, here. And I want to go into this section here and eventually to bring up the slides. So these are the slides that I want to walk my way through. You don't necessarily have to uh, follow them along on your laptop. You can just uh, follow them as I displayed them to you, I guess is the easiest thing. Uh, before I go any further now, just are there any initial questions that people have for me since we last met? No, no. all good here. Good, right. So um, uh, between this lecture and the next lecture, uh, we want to do a fairly quick uh, review, hopefully, of JavaScript for everybody. If you haven't seen JavaScript before, then uh, it'll be the first time. But everybody is a competent programmer, so I don't need to go into the fundamentals of programming. Really, all I want to cover is the syntax of the language and the semantics of it. Uh, I'll give you a tiny bit of background to the language itself. I won't spend long on that. And then I'll start looking at the way I'm approaching uh, our review of the language is to look at how we represent data first in the language. And it's all about the uh, objects in JavaScript, which are kind of like objects in Java, but uh, JavaScript kind of predates Java. So, um, but we'll see what we mean by objects in a second. And then in the next lecture, I will start looking at how we represent behavior or logic in JavaScript. And it's all about functions. I know uh, some of you may know that JavaScript does actually have a class construct um, as of 2015, but at the core of the language, it does not have classes. It only has this notion of functions, which are kind of equivalent to methods. If you can envisage a method without it being necessarily associated with a class. So that's, uh, that's how I'll approach it. Uh, this slide and the next slide, really all they're telling us is that JavaScript is an extremely important language for any computer science graduate to have because it's arguably the most commonly used and popular language out there and has been for a number of years. The slide that you're looking at now is just a survey carried out on GitHub as to the various repositories across the globe that are actually using JavaScript and other languages. So you can see JavaScript uh, is number one and has been for a number of years. This is slide shows you the results of a survey that is carried out every year by Stack Overflow. Uh, now, I just noticed before I started the lecture, this is from 2020. You can see there in the URL, it's actually a survey that was done in 2020. But if you look at the 2021 results, it's very, it's very similar in that all that has changed, I think, is Python has actually jumped over SQL. 
the definition of a language now is fairly general here, admittedly. Uh, would you regard HTML as language? Probably a lot of people would say no, but uh, you get the idea. The main message is that JavaScript from Stack Overflow's perspective, this is just a straightforward survey now, really. Uh, so it depends on how many respondents they got, but uh, JavaScript has been number one in terms of it being used out there in the industry for quite a number of years as well. So both, both graphs really tell us the same story. You can read through this yourself, this slide. The, the main thing I want to just bring to your attention is the link between the JavaScript language, language and something called ECMAScript. Uh, I'm mentioning ECMAScript here. So the Java language itself was designed by a guy called Brendan Eich back in the early 90s. And it's one of these kind of folklore stories that he literally developed the language. Well, it varies depending on articles that you read. Some say he developed it over a long weekend. Some say it, it took about two weeks to develop, but either way, it was a mammoth task. Um, he developed this over a very short period of time. And after a number of years, he handed the language over to this ECMA organization. ECMA stands for European Computer Manufacturing Manufacturers Association. It's essentially just a standards body that defines standards in various aspects of computing. And so they took the language that he designed and they kind of abstracted from it a specification for that language. So the, the implementation kind of came first and then the specification, which is kind of the, the, the odd way. And they call that specification the uh, ECMAScript. So strictly speaking, ECMAScript is the specification for the JavaScript language. Now the ECMAScript specification has evolved over the years. So the first ECMAScript specification, which we call ES1, that was in June, 1997. And over the years then that specification has evolved and the language has evolved with it. Uh, arguably the language has kind of lagged behind the specification. It depends really on the vendors, different vendors uh, have implemented different aspects of the specifications over time. Now, the really important of all of these ECMAScript specifications, the, uh, the really important one is ES6, uh, which was released in 2015. It's also known as ES2015. That was a turning point in the language because it was actually prior to then, prior to 2015, there was a period when it was felt that the JavaScript language was going to become redundant because it was only executable within browsers and it wasn't used that much as it turns out. Uh, but it got a major reboot in its popularity, arguably due to the release of Node.js. Node.js, as you may or may not know, is a platform that allows us to execute JavaScript outside of the browser. Before Node.js came along, which I'm saying here is around 2009, the only place JavaScript code could be executed is inside a browser. That was pretty restrictive, but Node.js actually allows us to run JavaScript outside a browser. And we often refer to Node.js as being server-side JavaScript. Now, uh, when Node.js came on the scene and it uh, became very popular very quickly because there was a large JavaScript community out there, I suppose, the ECMA uh, organization decided to do a major uh, revision uh, of the language and they released the specification uh, um, emerging from that called the ES6 specification. As I said, ES6 is also known as ES2015. And they introduced a lot of features to the language, mainly as a result of serving uh, the community that was using it. Uh, they introduced a lot of features to the language. One feature they introduced to the language was the notion of classes, because uh, around then, you know, there were lots of class-based programming languages like Java and Python, et cetera, uh, but JavaScript did not have it. And a lot of people were arguing that it should have it. So they introduced classes amongst other things to the language. But ES 2015, as I said, was a turning point. So we often refer to, when we talk about JavaScript, we often refer to pre-ES6 and post-ES6. 
And by pre-ES6, we really mean ES5. Um, we don't tend to worry about the ones before ES5. So you, you uh, hear me mentioning ES5 JavaScript and ES6 JavaScript uh, every now and again during this module. And since 2015, uh, every year, the ECMA organization has released an update to the ECMAScript specification. So we have ES6 in 2015, ES7 in 2016, and so on and so forth. And there's literally been a new release of the specification every year since 2015. And the various vendors, that being browser vendors, as well as the community that look after Node.js, they try and keep up with the language. And by that, I mean they try and support any new syntax or semantic features introduced by the, the ECMAScript specification. They try and uh, support them uh, in the runtime environments that they provide, be that the browser vendors or the Node.js community. That's really the main thing that I want you to get from this slide, the relationship between JavaScript and ECMAScript. So as I said there, uh, the ECMAScript specification is being updated year on year and the various browser vendors and the Node.js community are trying to support the new features. But there are still a lot of browsers out there that won't necessarily support the latest and greatest aspects of the JavaScript language. And if we are writing browser-based JavaScript, i.e. JavaScript that we want to execute in a browser, we can't really develop JavaScript code that only runs in the new browsers. That wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, we want to make sure that any browser can run our JavaScript, but we're kind of in a catch-22. We want to write modern JavaScript, i.e. ES6 and post-ES6 style JavaScript. Yet we want our JavaScript to be able to run in any browser that only supports ES5 and older versions of JavaScript, in particular ES5, really. So what do we do? Well, fortunately, there are tools out there, our A tool called Babel, or Babel, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And the Babel tool will take your ES6 or ES7 or ES8 JavaScript, and it will convert it back to ES5 JavaScript. And so we know that every browser out there now at this stage will be able to execute ES5 JavaScript. So this transpilation, as it's referred to, converting ES6 plus JavaScript to uh, converting it back to ES5 JavaScript, we refer to that process as transpilation, and the Babel tool does it for us. And right throughout this module, uh, we will be using Babel uh, behind the scenes. We, we, we hardly ever invoke it directly ourselves. It will just be built into whatever tools we happen to be using. But you just need to be aware of the fact that this transpilation does have to take place. That's my background. <laughs> now I want to talk about the actual language itself and how we code in the language. And in this set of slides, I'm just focusing mainly on how we represent data or state in JavaScript. I'm going to pause for a second, just in case anybody has any questions so far. No? Any language is going to have its primitive data types, and the primitives in JavaScript are no different from any other language. So we can represent numbers, strings, booleans. It has the null type, which is very similar to the null uh, value in, in Java. Pretty well, everybody amongst you has Java. Uh, some of you have Python, but uh, the common denominator is Java. So it's the null in JavaScript is uh, we can regard it as equivalent to the null in, uh, in Java. But then there's this other odd one that kind of throws people. There's this undefined type or undefined value. If you declare a variable in JavaScript and you do not initialize it, then by default, it is assigned the undefined value. It is not null. It is defined. It is assigned the undefined value. 
That's what I'm saying here. And apart from primitives, then the only other structure for representing data in JavaScript is the object structure, which I'll come on to in a few minutes. The third point I'm saying is that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. Java is a statically typed language. Python is also dynamically typed. What dynamically typed means is when you declare a variable and you assign, let's say we assign a string to that variable, there is nothing stopping you subsequently assigning a number to that variable or a Boolean. Uh, in other words, the variable itself does not have a type bound to it. It is dynamically determined. You cannot do that in Java, as you know. When you declare a variable in Java, you have to say what type of variable is it, it is, and you can only assign values of that type to that variable. Now, this dynamic uh, type ability is a really powerful feature in JavaScript and other languages that are dynamically typed. It can also be a source of annoying errors, but uh, you kind of take that with the benefits that it gives you. Now, uh, I have various little sample code that I want to uh, step my way through uh, in this lecture. And uh, the code will be available to you in the lab accompanying this uh, set of slides. So you'll get at it there. For me, I have the code on my desktop somewhere. So it's here. And I'm going to bring that into VS Code. I have VS Code already running. And as you may have discovered, if you've played around with VS Code at all uh, in the last few days, to import it, you can just do a drag and drop. So here are the various uh, JavaScript files that I want to step through. And okay, there's a bunch of JavaScript files. There also happens to be an index.html. And I'm sorry, except that. And what I've also done is I have installed an extension or a plugin to my VS Code installation. And I show you in the lab how to do that. And really, the plugin, it's not that uh, sophisticated, it's just an ordinary web server. And I can run that web server from within VS Code. So when you've installed the server, it's uh, oh, sorry, this extension, it's called the, li the live server extension. After you've installed it, what you'll notice down in the bottom right here is a go live link in the status bar. And if I click that, what that will do is it will start a web server, it's a standard uh, web server, uh, it'll start it from the workspace that I'm currently looking at. So it'll start it from this workspace here. And the server will go looking for a file called index.html, and it will serve that file to a browser. And it'll automatically open up the browser. So if I click this go live here, there it has fired up a browser tab and this tab now is showing the index.html and we can prove that if we actually look inside the index.html it doesn't really show have anything displaying on the browser itself except that uh, header if you like and then there's a whole bunch of script files that i'm referencing the script files being these here on the left and what I'm going to be doing is enabling and disabling those as I step my way through the slides. And each JavaScript file is just demonstrating a particular feature of the JavaScript langu language in, in terms of data representation. What's nice as well is if you make a change to this file, then the live server that I have started will pick up the change and it will automatically push that change down to your browser tab. This is what we refer to as live reloading. So you don't have to go doing manual refreshing in your browser tab. Now, 
in terms of what the is being displayed in the browser it's it's not really i'm not really interested in what's being displayed here what i'm really interested in is what is uh what's happening in the console associated with the browser as you may or may not know each browser browsers today have very sophisticated tooling built into them we often refer to them as developer tools and to access the developer tools in the chrome browser and i would recommend everybody use chrome for this module um, if you the long-winded way of doing it is if you select more tools here and developer tools um don't know how much you have played around with the developer tools associated with browsers but they're they're extremely useful when you're mainly when you're doing debugging i guess uh, and they will become very useful to us later on in this module right now uh, inside of these developer tools, you can do lots of things. You can do things like inspect what kind of network communication is going on between your browser and whatever server it's talking to, um, and lots of other things. Right now, what we're interested in is the console associated with the browser. Uh, so if in the JavaScript that's running behind this page here, if the JavaScript tries to output something, then the output will come to this console here. Right. Um, as I said, the, the lab steps you through the whole setup that you need to do in order to, um, to follow along, I guess. So right now, sorry, if I look at the index.html, um, as well as this, it's also referring to a particular source file called primitives.js, which is this one here. And it's not a very interesting piece of JavaScript code, but we've got to start somewhere. So inside here, I have some JavaScript and I'm showing you how to declare primitive variables. That's all that's going on here. So uh, there's our keyword less. The keyword less means that you're declaring something. Here's the name of my variable and I'm assigning it, uh, in this case, a numeric value and so on for the other ones. So they're all fairly standard things that I don't need to explain. This line here, uh, console.log, is how you output something to the screen. Now, by outputting to the screen, if I was running this code from the command line, then it would be outputted to my terminal. But I'm actually running this code in the browser. So my console.logs are going to appear in the developer tools, in the console part of the developer tools. And we can see evidence of it here. That there came from the first console.log that you have here. I'm going to stop for one second now, just make sure you're, um, you're okay with what I'm doing here. Yeah, it looks grand. Yeah. Now, the way I'm actually uh, constructing what I want to output is, it's not great really. I'm doing kind of concatenation as it's called. I'm saying output the value of foo one plus output space plus output the value of foo two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's all right, but we'll, we'll see a much better way of doing it in a while. Uh, just keeping on, uh, even though it is a very simple piece of script, you see foo here, Foo one, I'm assigning it a numeric value. So I'm I'm reassigning a different value to foo one. Do not use the let keyword here. You only use the let keyword when you declare the variable initially. When you reassign it, you drop the let keyword. That's all that's uh, I'm, I'm trying to get across there. In this line here, foo two, I'm assigning a numeric value, but up here. When I initialized foo2, I signed it a string. That's now an, uh, an example of this dynamic typing. So foo2, initially it was assigned a string. Now I'm certainly assigning a numeric value to it. And that's acceptable in JavaScript. Now, whether it's a good idea to have, you know, to be doing that in terms of your code design, arguably it's probably not, but 
uh, you can do it within the semantics of the language. Here I'm declaring another new variable called foo5, but I'm not initializing it. And I said a while ago that when you declare a variable and you do not initialize it, then foo5 is going to have the quote unquote value of undefined. So when I do a console.log of foo5, you see that I actually get undefined. Um, sorry, no. I get the undefined value. Moving on, console.log that, pi equals that. Why is that an error? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, a, the, so the let keyword is a keyword that you prefix any variable declaration with. Uh, and it's actually telling us that the variable will be reassigned a value or can be reassigned a new value subsequently. Here, I'm declaring a variable and I'm prefixing it with the keyword const. Const, a const variable cannot be reassigned. So once you've assigned a value to pi here, you cannot subsequently uh, assign a different value to it. So that's why I'm saying that this line here would throw an error. And if I uncomment it, I'm uncommenting it, and now I'm going to save the file, but because of my web server that I've started behind the scenes, it will automatically push the updated script file uh, down to my browser tab. So I don't have to do manual refresh, but I'll do my save, flip over to the browser. Uh, and you can see I'm getting an error there. And the, the error is essentially telling me uh, that you declared pi as a const, but you're now trying to assign a different value to it. And that's not allowed in the language. So I'll clean up that, save again, and now my error is gone. Okay, so where are we now? Uh, we've done that. Um, again, you can read through this. So we have my let keyword, I have const. Uh, so you, you either use let or const. You could be lazy and just use let all of the time even though you know the variable that you're declaring, once you've initialized it, it won't be changing its value. Uh, that will still work, but it's kind of lazy, as I said. Const is, uh, is mainly used to help other people that are reading your code. When other people are reading, or when you're reading somebody else's code and you see a variable that is declared with const, then that tells you straight away something about that variable. It is a constant. It will not be reassigned a different value anywhere else. Now, there is a little bit of a catch with const, which I'll come back to in a while, but that's the idea behind it. And const uh, was something that was new, that was introduced in, I don't think it was ES6, actually. I think it might have been later than ES6. Obviously, every variable has an identifier, um, I'm saying here. There are various rules in terms of what's valid and what's not valid as an identifier. I'm not going to go through them, but they're all they're the usual kind of things, like you can't have a space in an identifier name and all that kind of stuff. Operators, again, that's standard. Um, once upon a time, you had to use your a semicolon at the end of every statement in JavaScript, but that's almost optional now at this stage. And I think in, in my code, sometimes I lapse into using semicolons, sometimes I don't. So I'm using them a lot there now, but you don't actually have to put in the semicolon at all, um, unlike Java where you, you have to. Uh, so the semicolon is optional and it turns out, uh, so I was, speaking there earlier on about the, the fact that we need to transpile our code from ES6 plus back to ES5. And the Babel or Babel tool does that for us. What Babel will automatically do is it will insert semicolons uh, for you anyway. 
So the transpiled code has semicolons inserted. That's something we called automatic semicolon insertion ASI. It's just something that the Babel tool does for us. Uh, okay, I'm saying here that if you're in the habit of not using semicolons in your code, the only case where it can you, uh, catch you out is if you have a statement that is multi-line, then it may actually confuse the runtime environment. Of course, JavaScript now is not compiled. We don't compile JavaScript. We can write JavaScript and run it straight away. Uh, we don't have to compile it first. And so you won't know there are errors on your, in your code until you actually run it. But if you are in the habit of writing complex multi-line statements, and you're also in the habit of not using semicolons, there may be very particular cases where the runtime actually misinterprets your code. It's very, very, very unlikely that that's gonna to happen to you, but I'm just putting it in there for completeness. Uh, I've already kind of alluded to the difference between let and const. Um, so I'll just I'll skip over that really. Uh, I'm saying that whether you use let or const, any variable has what I'm calling block scope, which is really the exact same as in Java. Remember in Java, if you declare a variable inside a class, it is only accessible inside that class. If you declare a variable inside a method in Java, it's only accessible inside that method. So that's what we mean by the scope of a variable. Uh, and as we know in Java, a class is wrapped by curly braces. So it's the curly braces that the Java compiler uses to determine the scope of variables. Also in Java methods, we use a curly brace to uh, delineate the beginning and end of a method. And it is those curly braces that define the scope of any variable defined inside that method in Java. It's really the exact same in JavaScript. Now that block scoping in JavaScript was only introduced in ES6. Prior to that, there was a different scoping uh, mechanism used by the language, which I don't need to go into. So that makes it easy, really, if you're coming from a Java background to understand the scope of a variable. Equally, if you declare a variable inside a for loop in JavaScript, uh, because we also use curly braces to define the beginning and end of a for loop, any variable declared inside a for loop uh, has the scope of that for loop only, same with if statements and same with, same with functions, even though we haven't seen functions yet. So apart from primitives, uh, obviously primitives are basic. Uh, they don't allow us to in any way represent data structures in any way or any kind of complex data structures. And so for complex or non-trivial data structures in JavaScript, we have the notion of an object. So the object structure is our unit of composition, if you like, for data or state in, in uh, JavaScript. And an object really is very similar to a map in Java. An object is a collection of key value pairs where each key value pair is referred to as a property. So if I fast forward down to this part of the slide here, here I'm declaring a variable called me and I'm assigning an object to it. And so this is the syntax, the curly brace. Uh, we actually use the curly brace for defining the beginning and end of an object as well. So it's not we really got to do with scope, I suppose. But uh, and so in this particular object, I have one, two properties. Each property is comprised of a key and a value. Uh, the value, in this particular case, the values happen to be of the same type, but that's very rare. They're usually different types. So for now, anyway, the me variable is an object with two properties. One property has the key first name and the value Dearmerd. The other property has the name, last name and value O'Connor. I'm saying up here that values can be primitives. And in fact, as we see later on, 
the value could be another object. So you can have objects uh, within objects. In other words, nesting of objects. And that's what you will come across more commonly, really. So this is how I declare an object structure. This is the syntax for it. Uh, you can actually uh, uh, you can actually have a comma here after the last key value pair in ES5. You couldn't. If you had a comma here, you got a runtime error. But because it was something that people were doing uh, accidentally, I suppose, really, and it was kind of an annoying error in ES somewhere ES6, post ES6, uh, we we're actually allowed to have a comma at the end and it won't cause an error. So sometimes you might see me having a comma at the end. Sometimes you, you won't, but uh, uh, it's not going to be a problem either way. Once you've declared an object, then typically you will want to access particular properties within that object. You want to be able to do that within your code, or you may want to change the value associated with a particular key. So how do we do that? How do we manipulate the object? And I'm saying here that there are two notations that you uh, can use. There's the dot notation and there's the subscript notation. The dot notation, uh, here's an example of it. So it's the object name, the dot character, followed by a key name. So this expression here, uh, if I did a console.log of this expression, it would output Dermot to the screen based on the previous slide. That's the dot notation. Here's the subscript notation where you use the square brackets. And you must remember to put the key inside single quotes. And again, this expression is going to evaluate to uh, Dermot as well. OK, uh, leaving out the quotes is another source of errors initially, I guess. So. Uh, you have to use them. You use the same notation if you actually want to change a particular property in an object. Uh, so you can see in this example here, I'm changing the, the effect of this statement here is to change the value associated with the first name key in the me object to Jeremiah. And this is changing the other uh, property within that object. I'm saying next that the subscript notation supports a variable. So if I declare this variable here, it doesn't matter what the variable name is, but it happens to be called key. And I'm assigning it a string. It has to be a string. Then this expression over here, way over here, this now is going to execute successfully because all that really happens is at runtime, it's going to take key no here now, I am not putting quotes around key. Key is just a variable. So at runtime, the runtime variable is going to know this is a variable. It's going to find the variable and it's going to see what value is assigned to it and it will substitute the value into this expression here. So this now becomes me subscript first name, uh, where first name is the string, sorry, last name, where, where this um, uh, the value of the string the value of the variable is the string last name, as I have on the left. Here's the gotcha. I mentioned about the const earlier on. You declare a variable and you, and you declare it with the const variable. I said you cannot reassign a different value to that variable. But if you declare a variable and you assign it an object structure, you can actually change the internal properties of that object. Okay, so I'm saying that the object is mutable. It can be changed. And that does throw people initially. And it's just the way that it is. Because really, if you think about it, if I go back to the previous slide, so I've declared me here as a const and I've assigned it this object. If I change this value here associated with this property, I'm not assigning, I am not assigning a new object to me. I'm only changing the internal structure of the object. 
So by virtue of the fact that I'm not assigning a new object to me, then I am honoring the properties of const, if you like. Let's look at an example. Uh, so the O2 example. And so the way you kind of play with these things now is you go into index.html. I'm going to comment out this line. And I'm going to enable this line. And every time you must save the file, when I save it, now, before I look at what happens in the browser, if we look at the actual JavaScript, you know, it's uh, very simple stuff really. So I've declared an object up here and the running joke every year is that this object contains information about me, much of which is not true. I am not 21. I do not have a bank balance of that many million. Uh, the rest is true. So here's my object. And I'm just doing console.log of various parts of the object just for demonstration purposes. So this console.log here, if we look at what actually happens in the browser, uh, it outputs this. Uh, here I'm just demonstrating the fact that you can have variables and use variables in your um, when you're trying to dereference a particular object. So I've got a I'm declaring a variable here called BB, which is a bad name for a variable, but and I'm initializing it to this string bank balance. Okay, so this is a string bank balance. And down here, then I am using me dot bb in my console dot log so this is going to evaluate to me subscript bank balance and bank balance is a valid key within my object so it should output that value there and does it do that uh, we can see that it does there in the second uh, console dot log output Now, I said there are two notations for accessing properties within an object, the subscript notation and the dot notation. And I, I kind of indicated that uh, it's really, it doesn't really matter which one you use. It's a matter of style. In most cases, it doesn't. But in some cases, you have to use one over the other. And so here's a case in point. What I'm saying here in this commented line here is, I cannot use me.bb to access this particular value here. That ain't going to work. Uh, and to prove it, if I do, how do I prove it? Yeah, I'll just do it here, right? If I go me.bb. Save that. And I guess undefined. Now, this undefined pops up in a couple of places. One is if you declare a variable and you do not initialize it, then that variable has the value undefined um, by default. The second place that undefined pops up is if you try and access a property of an object that does not exist, the property does not exist, then the expression that you use will evaluate to undefined. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to access a property called BB within the me object. And you can see up here, it doesn't have a property called BB. So this expression actually evaluates to the value undefined. That's just the way it is in the language. That's how it's, you don't get an error as such. Um, what we say is that the runtime is silent about the fact that the property doesn't exist, but that's what happens anyway. So I have no option 
in this case, but to use the subscript notation, if I want to use the BB variable, I cannot use the dot notation. So I've got to go back to that. Just pause for a second. I wonder if there are any questions so far. No, I'm still all good on my part anyway. Anybody else? No, all good so far. OK. Uh, moving on. Uh, objects are, where am I in the slides? Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, all I'm demonstrating here down at the bottom of the script is if I go me.address, what am I trying to do there? Oh, yeah, I'm just changing. I'm just showing it. You can change a property value. So there is a, already a property in my object called address, and I want to change it to something else. So that expression is fine. And then when I do console.log of me.address, it's going to output the new value. So that's just standard object manipulation. Objects, characteristics, objects are dynamic. By that, I mean you can add new properties and remove properties from an object after you have declared it. Um, and so we're told to look at sample three. Now I'll just quickly look at it. I won't demonstrate it. You can do that yourself. So I have the me object here again, and I'm going me.employer. Now there is no property up here called employer but uh, the runtime doesn't mind about that. It interprets what you're trying to do here as you're trying to add a new property called employer and assign it that value. So that works fine. And when you do a console.log of me.employer, uh, it will output what we expect it to output. Uh, from a syntactic point of view, the syntax is slightly clumsy here, but this is how you remove a property from an object. And so after executing that line, if I now try and do me.age down here, can anybody predict what console, what this console.log is going to output? It's going to be an error. Uh, what, what, what might the error say? Uh, it would either be null or it would be undefined. Uh, it would be undefined. That's the same as the previous example. Uh, undefined, I suppose you could say, yeah, undefined is an error, but JavaScript has runtime errors, just like you might get in Java. Um, yeah, but so anyway, in this case, me.age is just going to come up as undefined because there is no longer a property called age in the me object. And you can prove that to yourself. Objects can be nested. So a property can have a value that is itself an object. And so we're going to look at sample 401. Here's 401. So here's my me object again. This time the name key has as its value an object. Uh, with key value pairs, so does finance as key value pairs. And so now when we're trying to access any of the values within those nested objects, then we just follow the same basic rules. Um, so for example, here I'm going uh, me dot name subscript first, and you can mix and match the notations as much as you want to. I could have written me dot name dot first, uh, but uh, just for illustration purposes, I use the subscript notation uh, as well as the dot notation. So this entire expression is going to evaluate to uh, Dermot. Uh, kind of mistakes that people might make as beginners is if you put a dot in here, okay, that's just a syntax error. Um, equally, if you, let's see, um, obviously if you put a dot in there, that's not going to work. I could have changed this to 
If I do want the doc notation, I change it to this. Okay, so as beginners, uh, if you like, or when you're um, writing this kind of object navigation syntax, as I said, you may make those initial kind of uh, syntactic errors. So uh, it's just a case of practice, really. Again, you can look at the detail of uh, that yourself later on. A property value at the very bottom, I'm saying a property, a property value can be a variable reference. Or to look at sample four two, and based on my time now, I'm going to have to try to get further, but so be it. Here's sample four two. So I've got the name object here, and then inside the me object, I have a key called name, and I've got the value name. But this name is referring to is a variable reference. It's referring to uh, the variable that I've declared up here but that will evaluate fine. And so essentially it, it replaces the name variable with whatever you assign to it. So it, it inserts the nested object if you like. It doesn't literally, it, it does not literally insert it. It just follows the pointer if you like. This is really pointing to an, another memory location. That's all that's going on there. But you can still use the, you can still treat it as if the actual name object is inserted within the me object and that's really what i'm doing here as, as you can see uh, i'm doing it with finance i'm doing it with i'm doing it with name me.name.first so me.name is referring to a particular property within the me object but then it's certainly jumping over to the name object and finding the key first inside of it but you can't tell you cannot tell from this statement here that the name is a separate object, if you like. Right, um, I'm not gonna try and rush it now. I haven't gotten as far as I wanted to, but I'm gonna uh, leave it at that for today and we'll pick it up the next day. I'm not sure when my next lecture, which is, but uh, it is when it is. Just before you wrap up, are there any questions before we leave it, I wonder? Yeah, I have a few questions about the whole module. Okay, uh, far uh, away, we'll see how far we get. Yeah, I uh, I was actually absent the whole last week, so I just have a few questions. Um, uh, in this module, uh, I read the overview. Uh, it says that we should uh, we we um, we have twenty five percent of the whole module on uh, um we, um that depends on labs. Uh -huh. So does that mean we have to uh, upload labs every week? No, uh, you will be uploading two labs. One will be uploaded roughly around week seven, and the other one will be uploaded uh, at the end of the semester. You will be, uh, you will be incrementally developing an app, both the front end and the back end, uh, in the labs for this week and next week, the labs will be all about JavaScript and you won't be uploading that work as such. But once we get into talking about the frameworks that we're going to be using to develop our web app, i.e. React and Node Express, it's from then on that you will need to, uh, it's, it's from then on that uh, it's that work that you will be uploading to to Moodle, but the short answer to your question is you will only be uploading two times um, your lab work, one around week seven, one around week 12. And, and those two labs are different from the two assignments, yeah? Yes, they are. Okay, so the two labs are uh, two, like two separate projects and the assignments are something completely different. Uh, essentially, I suppose the assignments, um, they kind of build on the labs, what you develop in the labs, you take that and you uh, extend. Okay. Uh, uh, you or you extend um, what you've developed in the labs. Yeah. That's a bit, uh, that's a bit vague, but that that's that's roughly how it's going to work. If you get a chance to maybe watch the video 
uh, if I go back to where am I now? Am I still sharing my? Yeah, screen? I, I watched that video, but uh, just want to all right. Clarification. Okay. Yeah. Some point of clarification. That's fine. Okay. And uh, another question. Um, I, I noticed there are uh, solutions within the labs. Um, if we get stuck in exercises or labs and we use those solutions, do we still get marks for the lab completion? Uh, I provide solutions for this week's labs and next week's labs. In other words, the kind of JavaScript ones. I don't provide solutions for the subsequent labs, though. Okay. So, but in the subsequent labs, there aren't many exercises. It's more a case of um, following along the steps that, uh, to, to, to develop the, the app that you're going to be developing. So they are okay. very prescriptive, the labs. They're quite long. Uh, you can still make mistakes, mainly in the form of cutting and pasting. So you, you do have to pay attention as you're cutting and pasting code into files. Um, towards, I do try and have one or two exercises maybe in, in the labs, all right? So it's not completely cutting and pasting. But, okay. uh, in the, yeah, but the, the, the labs we're going to upload are also built on uh, this week's lab, yeah? Uh, or is no. this week's lab just an exercise? This week's lab is just an exercise. Okay. And next week's lab is just an exercise as well? Uh, it is actually, as it turns out, yes, it is. Okay. So starting from week three is uh, the labs that we built on and we get marks for, right? Yeah. And I, I think I'll probably remind you of that anyway when we, when we get to it. Okay. Uh, where can we find the recording of this meeting Zoom? Uh, so I will just do a tiny bit of editing of it and then I will make it available right here. Okay. Do you, are you still seeing my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just as here is where you get access to the recording for the yeah. first lecture, you get you see a similar card for yeah. this week's lecture and all subsequent lectures. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. We, okay, uh, just just one one last question. I just remembered, please. Sure. Um, uh, because I was absent uh, that last whole week, I just want to uh, um, make sure that my name is on your list, uh, please. Uh, is that is that all right? Uh, can you see the module on Moodle? Yeah, I can see it here. Yeah, in that case, you're fine. Okay. Then. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I just want to complete this set of slides and this is where we left off in the lecture. We had talked our way through this slide. So moving on. Here I've got some other useful object related techniques. Uh, sometimes if you just want to extract the keys associated with an object, maybe you've got a method and it's passed in an object and that object structure could be different from invocation to invocation. So this uh, technique here allows you to identify what are the keys in the object that was passed in. Uh, object with a capital O is it's essentially a special global object that's made available in your runtime. And it has a method associated with called key. And so what this expression returns is an array of strings essentially where the strings correspond to the names of the keys in this object here. Similarly, you might want to extract just the values associated with an object. So this is the expression that you use to do that. If you want to test whether an object has a particular key or not, or property or not, there's the in operator, which is a new operator that was introduced kind of post ES6. And we have examples of all of those in the 042 script. So let's have a look at that. I need to start my live server now again. Open up my developer tools. So, okay, I've got the 042 script currently active. And if we look at the actual script itself, then just scrolling down. So here's the 
here's the me object from before. And if I scroll down, I've got here object.keys me, and then there I, I do a console.log of the keys variable. And so we can see here is the keys variable here. It's an array and these are strings and those strings do correspond to the names of the keys in my me object. Let's just check that. Yeah, so they match up. Uh, if I, just for convenience, I'm just gonna comment out that line so that our console doesn't get too cluttered. And if I enable this line and this one, here I'm just extracting the values in the me object and then I'm outputting them to the console. So I'll save that. This is what my array looks like this time. And again, they, they, they are indeed the values in my, in my me object. Finally, the n operator, I'll just take this out for convenience. I've got two lines here illustrating the n operator. So uh, address in me, note address here now is a string. You have to specify the property that you're checking for as a string. So this entire expression uh, results in a Boolean or it evaluates to a Boolean. And so we'd expect that to evaluate to true because the me object does have a property called address. Whereas we'd expect this one here to evaluate to false. And again, let's confirm that. Yeah, and then we get true and false. Okay, back to our slides. Now, what I'm just telling you about here is a very, very commonly occurring runtime error, and it is an error. And by an error, I mean your program will actually crash, your script will crash. As we know, JavaScript is something that is interpreted which means that when you run your code, it evaluates each statement line by line and executes it as it evaluates it. So once it hits a line or a statement that causes the runtime to throw an error, an exception really, then it stops at that stage obviously and it doesn't execute beyond that point. So there are lots of uh, exceptions that could be thrown one of the exceptions that you will come across for sure during this module is this error exception here. And what's it trying to tell us? But first of all, what I'm telling you in this slide here is that if you try to access an invalid property of an object, and I've mentioned this before, uh, then in that case, you will get the undefined value returned to you. Now, when an expression evaluates to undefined in a JavaScript script. That doesn't cause the runtime to crash because undefined is a valid value. So by not fatal here, I mean that uh, your code won't crash. And this can occur in many cases, but one case where it occurs is, as I'm saying over here, if you've got a valid object and you try to access or reference a property of that object, then that entire expression here, that's going to evaluate to the undefined value. Now, however, if you then try and treat that undefined value as if it was an object, then you're gonna get an exception. So in the general case, if you have some expression like this in your code, you've got a valid object, you're trying to reference an invalid property, and then you're treating that bad property or non-existent property as if it was an object uh, and you're trying to reference a property within that, then at that stage, this entire expression here, this entire expression is fatal. It will cause your runtime to crash and you will get 
this a variation on this error up here. And I'm just showing you kind of a screenshot of it. So as I've said, I'm pretty certain that every one of you will actually get this error at some stage during this module. And you first of all need to understand, well, why am I getting it? Trying to identify what caused it then, well, that's normal kind of debugging. But uh, the why I'm getting it is, I'm trying to explain here, it's when you try and treat, because I've already said now that this expression here, that's going to evaluate to undefined, which is a value. But in my code, then I'm treating that undefined value as if it was a valid object, because I've got this expression here, I'm doing dot property X of undefined. And that is when you get the exception drawn. And if you think about it, look what it's saying to you. It said, I cannot read the property of the undefined value because undefined is not a valid object structure. Uh, I'm illustrating it in the script here. So let's just prove the point. Let's look at the script first. So again, for convenience, I'm using the me object again, which we're familiar with. And I've got a console.log of me.finance.deposit. Now in my finance nested object, you can see there that it does not have a property called deposit. So based on what I've said from the slides, this is going to evaluate to undefined. So it's going to console.log undefined. Next line, I'm, I'm actually treating this expression as if it's a valid expression, as in it evaluates to a, some sort of object structure. And I'm trying to index into that object structure, picking out a property called bank. Now at this stage, this line is this line here is going to cause my runtime to throw an exception. And so let's see what happens in the console. And there's my exception. This this undefined here that came from the first console.log. This runtime error comes from the second console.log. Uh, if I actually switch the positioning of them. If I move this one up. Now what we'll notice is that this line of code here never gets to execute because the line before it caused the runtime to crash. And again, let's prove that. Okay, uh, so the, the console.log of undefined doesn't appear at all now in my browsers. Uh, console. So try and remember that uh, because, as I said, it will occur at some stage unless you're very, very, very lucky or a very talented programmer. Okay, uh, moving on. So that's objects. That's pretty much all we need to know about objects. You, what you need to be comfortable with is navigating nested object structures using a combination of the dot notation and the subscript notation, being able to code that properly. Uh, that's really the only challenge, if you like. Uh, arrays, uh, obviously any language work its sort is gonna have an array structure or support an array data structure. And as we know, an array is an ordered list of values unlike an object, an object is an unordered list of values. It doesn't have notion of the first property, the second property, the third property. It doesn't work that way for objects, but for arrays, order is important. The way we 
the syntax for defining a literal array is the same really as most languages. It's your square brackets and your values sub separated by commas. The values can be of any type. They can be primitives, they can be objects, uh, they could be other nested arrays. An array I'm saying here can have a mixture of different types of values within them. Unlike in Java, for example, where you need to declare what are the types of the values in the array or what is the type of the different values in the array. In JavaScript, you can have a mixture of types. In the small print, I am saying it may actually reflect poor design on the problem is part if they have arrays which vary in different types within it, that's probably not a good idea, but it's allowed from the syntax of the language point of view. And as with any language, the way we access the individual elements within an array is by using the subscript notation, where we tend to refer to the subscript as an index starting at zero, as always. And the zero 05 script shows us examples of arrays, but Nothing too interesting, really. So here's a very simple array declaration. Um, and here's how we're, we're using the subscript notation, using the index. So name subscript two is the third element, as you might expect. Let's just be sure of that. Yeah, so the five here is from the first console.log. So I need to close that off. I'm not interested in that. The array again. Uh, all I'm illustrating here is standard for loops for iterating over an array. Uh, and I'm showing you the old style for loop, the ES5 one, which is very like the Java syntax for a for loop. There's a slightly, but only slightly better form of it that was introduced in ES6. We often refer to it as the for of loop. So just take a note of the syntax there. But again, it's for iterating over an, an array. As it turns out, we see later on that we don't tend to use the standard for loop when we want to iterate over an array. We use a different technique, but we'll see that later on. Uh, here's something that you don't necessarily need to know, but it's what's actually happening uh, deep within the bowels of the JavaScript runtime. Uh, natively, the JavaScript language doesn't have an array type built into it. Most of the languages do. The only type of data structure that JavaScript has built into it natively is the object structure. Now, but still, the language syntax does support arrays, but it turns out that arrays are actually stored natively as objects, where the keys of the object are your indexes like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is what I'm seeing here. And the keys are actually converted to strings. As I say, you don't necessarily need to know that. Uh, it won't help you in your understanding of how to program arrays, which you're very familiar with anyway. But it's just a, a nice fact to be aware of. So what I'm saying here is that when you write an expression like that, which is normal array manipulation syntax, Internally, it's actually converted to this. And this looks like object structure manipulation, where this is a key within this object. But both of those expressions actually mean the same thing. This is how we code it. This is how it's interpreted internally by the runtime. And you know, we can approve that. I can change this statement here to well, it happens to be two again, but uh, to a string. 
Let's make it zero. Subscript zero. And then save that. So we expect that console.log to output 12. Uh, which it doesn't because I've made a syntax error. Yeah, which is what we get there. So just a nice to know fact, but other than that, it doesn't help us. Moving on. Uh, so an array object, and the difference between an object that's actually representing an array as opposed to an ordinary object is the runtime will add some other user properties to what I'm calling an array object, like the length property, if you want to find the length of the array. So you can write an expression like this. Uh, so there is a property called length automatically available to you. Then there are a couple of very useful methods that you can invoke on that array. Like we want to add elements and remove elements to and from the beginning and end of the array. And so there's this uh, push and pop operation, push and pop and shift and unshift. Push and pop, I think manipulate the end of the array when you want to add or remove elements uh, from the end of the array. Shift and unshift is when you want to add or remove elements to or from the front of the array. Join does what you expect it to do. There may be one or two other ones as well. Now, there are examples of those in the script that you can look through yourself. I've commented them out, but you can just comment them back in and just make sure you understand how they work. You've all come across the push and pop and shift and unshift operations before in other programming. Essentially, you're treating the array as either a stack or a queue. Uh, so you can play with these things yourselves later on. And so having objects and arrays available to us as two data structures for representing collections of information Really, that's all we need to represent any type of complex data structure that we want to by just mixing the array and object primitives in any way that we want to. So I'm just giving you sort of some English examples of them here. So there may be a case when you're implementing a particular problem domain that you want to have an array where each element in the array is, is also an array. Uh, so nested arrays, in other words, or two-dimensional arrays. So we might find ourselves writing an expression like this. And you need to be comfortable understanding what that is saying or what particular part of your nested array you're trying to access. Or we might have an array of objects. And so an expression like this would make sense. And you need to be comfortable uh, understanding that and writing that and so on for other examples. Uh, and I am saying down here, again, it's kind of a reminder to uh, a couple of slides back, where you get this, uh, this commonly reoccurring uh, crash error is when you're accessing values within a nested data structure, um, you will often get this error thrown back at you. And as I said, you first of all need to understand why you're getting the error. Uh, but it requires further debugging then to understand where it's coming from or what caused it, if you like. This is the last slide. Um, we've seen already in the very first script that I've shown you where we had a console.log statement that uh, implemented what's called string concatenation. Okay, where we're using this plus to construct our string. Now, string concatenation is it's very error prone in the sense that if you accidentally leave out a plus here, then obviously that's going to cause this line of code to crash. 
or if you accidentally leave out the, let's say the quote here, that's gonna cause a crash as well, because the, now the entire expression doesn't evaluate properly. And so for those reasons, in ES6, we were given string templates. String templates, I'm sure, is something you've come across in other programming languages. Many of the features that were introduced in ES6 and post ES6 were as a result of the JavaScript community requesting features that they used in other languages but were not available to them in JavaScript. And one of those features is string templates. And this is how we implement string templates in JavaScript. So instead of using concatenation, here we've got the same thing that we want to console.log, but we've wrapped it in one string. The only thing you've got to be careful about though is that this is not the single quote, this is actually the back quote or back tick. So you've got to wrap, the entire thing is what we call the string template. You've got to wrap your string template in these back tick characters. You can find them on your own keyboard. And then within the string, anywhere you have dollar curly brace, close curly brace, in here you can have a reference to a variable or you can have any kind of complex expression. And whatever is between the curly braces, that is evaluated. And the result of that evaluation is inserted into the entire string. And in this case, all we're doing with the entire string is console.logging it. But you could equally assign this expression to a variable. Uh, that's legitimate as well. So uh, in terms of uh, just syntax, backticks, and dollar curly brace, closed curly brace, and you can have any number of instances uh, of what are called the uh, interpolation. This, is, this part here is referred to as interpolation. You can have any number of these interpolation sub-expressions within the entire string. Uh, you can also have multi-line strings, which can sometimes be useful. I'm not sure if we ever really need to use them in our code. We certainly will use this kind of standard string template, all right. And again, you've got some examples of it in the 06 script, which I don't think I need to talk my way through. You can just look at it yourselves. Just have a quick look at it. Um, what am I doing? Just declaring an ordinary string here, an ordinary variable, sorry, another uh, variable which is evaluated to constant. Here's an example. Sorry, now let's see. Uh, okay, we haven't seen functions so far, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to work out what's going on here. I'm just declaring a function. It's past the variable and it does some sort of computation. Essentially, it's converting what it's converting imperial to metrics meters, that's all that line is really doing for me. Here's where the string templating comes in. So I'm assigning this template string to a variable. Uh, so you, you, need to, you should be able to work out that now for yourselves and then in console.logging it. I guess the important, the interesting thing is the fact, okay, here I'm just using an ordinary variable, but here I'm actually calling a function, this function here, calling a function, passing it a value. So whatever that function returns, and we can see what it's doing here, here's what it's returning, whatever it returns is what is inserted into my overall string. And here I've got an example of a multi-line string. Okay, so again, uh, you can explore that yourselves. And that's it. So it was all about how we represent data. Uh, and the really interesting part is the notion of objects. So you need to be very comfortable coding and understanding objects, manipulating them, uh, navigating them. Uh, we have arrays as well. And finally, we talked a little bit about string templates. And 
at the risk of annoying you at this stage, uh, I'm again ref reminding you of this commonly reoccurring runtime exception that can be drawn uh, that you need to be comfortable with understanding and interpreting. The debugging really depends on the nature of uh, where it occurs. Okay, that's it. Thanks.